I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Okay, this is part six of my uh, cr critique of Dr. David Menton's Lucy, She's No Lady. And uh, like the last one, I was successful at it. I'm going to try to combine two of his parts. It's an eight-part series. I'm going to try to do parts seven and eight in one video. Okay, so I'm skipping a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about, but that's okay. Uh, so he, let's see here on part seven, he talks about the difference. He does a great explanation again of the shape of the human uh, pelvic ilia and how it differs from an ape and why apes and humans are different. Um, but then he gets, this is just, this, this, this is nasty here, okay? He talks about the fact that Lucy, the, the pelvic ilia of Lucy, uh, pointed the wrong direction. They pointed, they pointed the direction like an ape's instead of like a, like a human being. Um, proving that she couldn't have walked upright and that she had to have walked like an ape. That was his, that's the implication he's making. And he said, what are Evos going to do about this? And then everybody laughs because he shows, and I think it jumps to part eight here, where he goes to Owen Lovejoy from a Nova video where he took a cast of the Lucy pelvis and he cut it apart, re-glued it together in the position of a modern human. And everybody's having a laugh over this. Ha, ha, ha. Right? How those, those, Evolutionists, if a fossil doesn't look right, carve it to make it look right. That's the implication. What he's not telling you now, now, if that pelvis, that fossil pelvis, first of all, was the only one in existence for Australopithecines, even, okay, that's something to talk about just Lucy or Afarensis. If that was the only one we had, so we knew nothing about this entire group of, of animal human things outside of this one pelvis. And it was in that shape. Now, you might think there might be a debate. There might be some, some scientists might say, well, maybe it's supposed to be in that shape. Maybe, maybe it hasn't been broken and refossilized. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit here. But, but the reality is we've got several others that are in the human position. Okay, that's what he doesn't tell you. So when Owen Lovejoy did this to this pelvis, he actually made it look like the other what is it? I know, I know of at least four other pelvical ilia from Australopithecines, including Afarensis, that we have, of which Lucy's was the odd man out. Lucy's was the one that was bent wrong. Um, looking at the shape of it, it that's where Owen Lovejoy. Owen Lovejoy is an anatomist and is is brilliant. He, when it comes to human locomotor anatomy, th there's nobody better. So when he looked at this pelvis and it's like that doesn't even fit right. No, no animal alive, ape or otherwise, has the blade at the angle like it is. And for him, you know, to imply that he's just being dishonest, that he's creating a fossil, that he's doing this imaginary thing, is bad. Okay. Now we can compare this. Now that we have, <coughs> we we didn't, now we have, we've actually had um, Af, Af, Australopithecus africanus sort of a similar species. We've had those pelvises for a long time. We've had several of them in great shape that haven't been broken, that are identical to modern humans, a little smaller, a little bit different. So, and he then he cites again, Stern and Sussman point out that the, that the pelvis of, of Australopithecus afarensis, they state that it doesn't, it's in the ape position, um, but it's short like a human's, but it's in the ape, faces the eight position, but then they state, he leaves this out, that it is clear that it has been broken and refossilized. They said it, what is it? Post-mortem damage to the fossil has occurred. But then they state that even if it's pushed into the modern position, which it hadn't been done at that time, apparently, that it still differs. There's a few things. They do They do speculate that they didn't have that, that uh, the muscles the same in the same position as modern humans, so they, they weren't as good as modern humans at walking upright is the conclusion they made. They, again, don't question the obligate bipedality of the species. So, the whole thing got a, it gets a great laugh, but it's the biggest bunch of crap. It is so dishonest. I mean, I honestly think it, it, in a just world, Owen Lovejoy would sue the shit out of Menton and any of the other people that bring that show that clip and try to imply what they imply because it's, it, you think that you could get away with that? I mean, there are scientists, there are legitimate scientists 
who don't think that oslopithecines belong on the human family tree. Okay, legitimate scientists that study them and don't think they think whatever you know they, and finding some evidence that like the that the pelvis is wrong, that the pelvis you know the pelvis could not have evolved into a human type pelvis. If that fossil had legitimately supposed to have been in that shape, they would have been jumping on that. They would have been the ones writing the papers and attacking Owen Lovejoy for it. You know what? Absolute silence. And you can say, well, it's not because there's a conspiracy and they want to keep. But no, they don't. If you read anthropology journals, they are very competitive with each other. Okay, there are lots of different lines trying to compete. Each one trying to promote this or that. Okay, and be- because of that, things that are false like that get weeded out really, really quickly out of that system. So it, it's just it just ticked me off. Then he has a quote from David Pilbeam. I'm not going to read you the whole quote here, but uh, I'll just read a quick section of it. What is it? My reservations concern not so much this book, but the whole subject and methodology of paleoanthropology. He goes on and on and on. That we've been flailing around in the dark. Our database is too sparse, too slippery for it to be able to mold our theories. Rather, our, the theories are more statements about us than ideology. Paleoanthropology reveals more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans come about. Now, if you believe uh, Dr. Menton... Pilbeam is admitting there that the entire science of paleoanthropology, that this honest scientist is admitting, we don't have, we, we got nothing. We're just fiddling around in the dark. And, you know, if you're honest with ourselves, we'd admit it that we, we don't have a, a clue. But the problem with that, okay, some of us in the world have access to, to online journals, complete online journals, including New Scientist. And um, that quote is supposed to be from a book review of Richard uh, Richard Leakey's Origins. It's not in there. That article, in fact, nothing by Pilbeam is in that year at all. Pilbeam has written nothing in New Scientist in that year. Um, so where did that citation come from? I, I did a Google search where I put that in quotes, portions, chunks of it in quotes. And you know what? Only creationist sites bring it up. There's no other site outside of creationist sites. They all like this. No, this here's a great quote from an evolutionist who's finally being honest. So where did the quote come from? I'm going to take a guess that somebody made it up. Somebody made it up, added some things to it, maybe changed whoever, whatever on it to it, maybe made it David Pilbeam if it wasn't him to start with. Anyway, it's fraudulent. David Pilbeam did not write that, in at least not there, if he wrote it somewhere else. If any of you know it, please PM me, put it in the comments. I'd love to see where the actual quote came from. All right, then he ends this. Um, fine, I'm going to end my last times here. With Good, I have just enough time to, to do this. He talks about how our view of origins affects how we behave. Now, this is the argument that you hear all the time. You tell a kid he came from a monkey... He's going to act like a monkey. That's that's the argument that he's making. He's saying that, you know, if, if you believe you're the special creation of God, then you'll act like a special creation of God. If you act like you're, tell a kid he's an animal, he's going to act like an animal. And um, PCS brought this up. Lots of creationists bring this up. It's a, you know, Hovind, uh, same, I guess same difference. Um, and now he sort of ends with that. And if, you know, that, that's just somebody, you know, that that standard creationist fare, um, which is like that's that argument of consequence, saying don't believe in evolution because if you do, it could lead to this bad behavior. Um, which unfortunately, the worst that's not the way science proceeds. Science proceeds through truth or not truth, not through p- potential consequences of people believing in it. But the question that I've always brought up, that I'll, that whatever I've heard that, because I remember, you know, when people say you weren't a true Christian. You know, fuck you if you say that. I don't care. Um, you don't have to believe I was a true Christian. I believed I was a true Christian. But anyway, either way. But so I, I the line that they used to use uh, in our youth group that we belong to was this: that you know, that you are, you're the slimy, disgusting, worthless piece of garbage that deserves to be thrown in hell and tortured forever. You know, you are, you don't even deserve to be in the same universe as God. You're that worthless. 
but only through his grace and mercy are you saved. So, I'm a bad person for saying to a kid, you know, do you know that your ancestors are apes? Or should I say to a kid, you're a worthless, disgusting, wretched scumbag. You're, you deserve to die and be burned forever. Anyway, that I'm going to end it here. All right, you guys know what I'm talking about. So take care. <laughs>